I'm so excited to introduce you guys to a plant fluencer, plant stylist, plant personality that I've been a fan of for a while. I mean, years. I've followed Mariah since 2020, and I've wanted to make her my plant friend for so long. <laughs> and when we finally got on our interview, I literally, before we started recording, was like, how are we not friends yet? Can you be my plant friend? I was such a nerd with her, but she's so cool. She's the plant stylist that we all want to be. So many of us who have dreamt about being a plant consultant or a plant doctor or a plant stylist transitioning into making plants our full-time job, Mariah has nailed it. Like she's the living example of what you can build in the plant space. And so today's conversation is part like entrepreneurial profile. I grill her a lot about how she built her business because I think it's fascinating and also plant styling tips. So you're going to hear both from her. And at the end, we're going to talk about her new book, a children's book, which needs to be in the world. I'm sending it to all of my teacher friends to put in their classrooms, but I'm going to let Mariah introduce herself and talk to you and share her motivations for the book in her own words. So without further ado, let's get to the podcast. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Mariah, welcome to Growing Joy. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I just kind of showed my cards offline, but I've been a follower and a fan of yours for multiple years. And I feel like now as the show has grown, you know, I get pitched guests a lot and sometimes I know them. Most of the time I don't. And when I heard your book was coming out and there was a potential for us to finally meet, I got so excited because I'm like a genuine fan of yours and I've loved watching your business grow. I think I started following you in 2020, but it's just been amazing to see how you've grown. And now you're an author. Welcome to the Authors Club. It's crazy. So many things. Also, you're making me feel like some sort of a celebrity and I can't, <laughs> I can't <laughs> receive any of that. But equally, I'm like, holy crap, since 2020, I'm like that partially entertaining. Since 2020, I'm like, I should pay your therapy bill because I feel <laughs> like all I do is talk shit on the internet and sometimes water plants, but it's also I very love it. fun. <laughs> well, I think too, especially in 2020 and 2021, I felt like you had this refreshing perspective sometimes like, and this is hysterical because me and my therapist always talk about toxic positivity and how I'm this mm. like, it's okay for me to not be so positive all the time because that's where I skew. But I really appreciate how real you are on your socials and how you're really not about having large plant collections. Like you kind of cut through the bullshit a lot, which <laughs> I just really appreciate as someone who is like sunshine and rainbows all the time. Like it's just, to me, I'm like very drawn to a personality like yours that is obviously very positive and very successful, but also like, guys, let's all relax. You had a post once being like, I went on TikTok and there's like a lot, you guys have a lot of plants over there. Like what's going on over there? <laughs> and there's no judgment. Like I really tried to reserve and withhold judgment, but equally I find it very difficult to mm -hmm. understand how people have this many plants, a full-time job, a part-time job, possibly kids. Yes, that's the thing you say. Like, we're not talking about that. And I find yeah. that maybe I'm just not built for it. I think it's me, but I will just say kudos to everyone who is balancing all that because I'm like, woo, I have to do one load of laundry. And then I go and take care of a client's plants and come home. And God forbid one of my plants needs water. Like that will set me off, let alone like a hundred of them. Totally. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole chapter in my book called The Dark Side of Plant Care, because yes. I think so many of us go through that experience where maybe you get too many plants, or I think a lot of us are going through this right now, where you have the season of life in the pandemic where you're home 90% of the time, you get 200 plants because it's bringing you so much joy, it's keeping you rooted, you have the time to care for them, and then life changes Either you move out of a pandemic, either you have your first kid, either you experience a mental health crisis, whatever. And then all of a sudden, those 200 plants aren't bringing you joy anymore. And you have to figure out how to navigate that. Do you give them away? Do you let them die? Do you whatever? Yeah, it's something I see a lot of people in this community go through. So I was like, yeah, she's speaking the truth. 
but it's part of the journey. Like I can only speak to that because I went through that, right? I was like, oh, well, I can't call myself a plant stylist unless I have every single plant in every piece of my apartment. So like I did that, I hoarded every single plant, but I will say that that experience taught me, like there's a reason that I preach this, like the right plants for your space. I had to get every single plant and put it into that north facing window to realize, yep. oh, a cactus is oh. not enjoying that. There's only one way to find out. So I completely get it. That's part of the journey. Right. There's only one way. I miss Plant Fail Friday. That used to be a very popular hashtag where people would like share their plant fails on Friday. And that to me mm-hmm. was Friday was so much fun because there's a lesson in every plant fail. There's a lesson in every dead plant. But anyway, we just dove really deep before we continue (laughs) diving deep. (laughs) Because we've been needing this conversation for a few years. That's why we're just going to get into it. (laughs) For a few years now. I'd love for people who don't know Mariah Green of the amazing Greenpeace business, Good Things book. I'd love for you to share how you became the plant lady that you are today. Yeah, it's because of all of you, if you're listening. So I... I used to be a elementary educator. So I moved to New York in 2000 and ooh, 2017. Oh my gosh. And so I came here to be a teacher. And while teaching, everyone in New York, it seemed had some sort of a side hustle. That's how you make it in the city. And so on weekends, I would just sort of like, I'd care for my plants. And then I started getting like asked from my coworkers and friends like, hey, I've got a couple of plants that aren't doing well. You know what you're doing. Can you come over and help me? I'd charge 10 bucks. Can you buy me a slice of pizza? Whatever. And it just kept growing and growing. No pun intended. And so Green Beast was ultimately born when I decided, what if I took this thing a little bit more seriously? It just felt like, I don't want to make it sound like it wasn't intentional, but it felt like a series of accidents of like, what if I just make a Squarespace website? What if I like get some business cards? What if I like call myself the plant doctor? And it just kept rolling. And so in short, Green Beast was born. And Greenpeace is essentially a plant styling company where we try to match you or we do match you with the right plants for your space and specifically for you based on how much you travel, your aesthetic, all the different factors so that you're not going into a plant shop and working backwards, just hoping that your plant will stay alive. And I love the riff. So your last name, G-R-E-E-N-E. Yes. I love that riff. I love that riff. How did you find the name for that business? Was it immediately there? Did you have to like noodle on it a minute? I had to noodle on it. I, for a while, was like, I want something punny, but equally, I don't know. It feels like so long ago, but I have to shout out. A friend told me there's this thing called nominal determinism. This is a new phrase for me, but it's basically your name informs what you do. And so like, I wish I had known that before I had paid thousands of dollars for grad school. (laughs) Not that it wasn't (laughs) useful, but had I just straight up known I was going to go into plants or something green, that would have been nice to know. But yeah, your name or my name has a piece of like what I'm doing now. And I'm, it's nice that it seamlessly fits because if someone is seeing me do something with plants, they'll naturally find my name tagged along next to it. So it's great. I love it. That's amazing. And what about your childhood growing up? Were plants a big part of your life growing up? Am I correct that you lived in Japan? I did. Okay. Yes. So I did live in Japan. I lived there for nine years and Thinking back, like, I feel like it's a very natural connection for someone to be like, oh my God, you lived in Japan and so the plants and nature. But I'm like, no, I was basically in Tokyo. Like there weren't too many trees, but the big piece, and my mom shouts this out constantly. She has tons of videotapes of me playing teacher with my friends. I was always a teacher. I was always assigning homework. I was always walking someone through how to do something. And so plants isn't necessarily the connection, but this idea of teaching some, I think back then it was probably me just being the bossy friend, but now it's this piece of like teaching and wanting to like share a wealth of knowledge with other people. I love that. And did plants come naturally to you? Like when did you get your first plant? I know that you've mentioned you've had to bring a lot of plants home and you've killed them, but was it intuitive for you to care for plants? Like how did you build the knowledge? When I first moved to New York, I got my first big girl apartment. And so I was really intentional about making the space mine and I was going to put some money into it. And so I bought a ton of plants. They all ended up dying. And I just was like, okay, this person sold me really bad plants. I knew I was going to get scammed in New York at some point. So I just got really like upset about it. And so then eventually I was like, you know what, I'm going to try again and I'm going to go back to that shop and I'm going to ask this guy, can you give me some directions about which plants or like, what is it I'm missing here? And eventually he told me, well, 
you're facing a brick wall and you're on the second floor. Like you have no business with these plans. Let's try something else. Yeah, exactly. And so then I was teaching at the time too, because that's why I came to New York. And so I started to make these connections of like so many of the things I was being taught in grad school and also in the classroom of, yeah, we've got this one size fits all lesson, but we also need to tailor it to 32 different kids in the classroom. There is no one size fits all model. And so I just started seeing all these similarities of, well, duh, that makes sense because like there are different climates all over the world. And like, you can find a certain tree here that you can't find here. And so I think it just naturally started to come to me. Oh, this is not just like a, a fun hobby where you, you get lucky or you're not, there's an actual science to it. And so once it, I slowly started to differentiate the pieces of that science, I just wanted to naturally share it with people because that's where the education piece of me comes in. I love that. And were you going to books? Were you going to websites? Were you going to, I don't know, like, were you taking classes? Like, what did that journey look like? I was going to books. I was talking to people. I was, and experimenting too. I was going to plant shops, like talking with people was the biggest thing. Like one person would be like, oh my God, ZZ plants are so easy. And someone else would be like, oh my God, I've only ever, I've killed a ZZ plant. I can't have any plants. And I'm like, what is this about? And there's, I think it's a natural thing that educators do or people that are just interested in figuring out a piece of a puzzle. I'm like, why is this one thing causing so much chaos? And how can I bridge the gap here? And so I think a big piece of it was just leaning into a ton of local conversations. I love that. Yeah, plant shop owners, people that work at plant shops are such underutilized. You could learn it all there. Totally. I remember when I started learning, so I used to like be an epic plant killer, but I, like the SIL used to do in-person, I think they probably still do that, but they used to do like in-person plant care tutorials. And I went Mm. to all of them. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's how I learned. They're so helpful. I used to go to the ones that rooted. Oh, and that's another piece. I completely forget about that because it was right before the pandemic. I worked at a plant shop. I worked at rooted. I learned so much there so quickly. Rooted NYC in Greenpoint? Yes. Yes. I used to work there. And when they moved to Chinatown right before the pandemic, I learned the most when I was there because I don't know, a big piece of me was like, if someone's coming to me to ask for this variegated rubber tree, and you're about to drop mad money on this tree, I feel so bad lying to you about what you need and if you don't have the right light, et cetera. So I'm like, can you give me one second? Let me go check in. I run and get my books or I Google it or whatever. And then I'm making the connections. And after like three years, that stuff starts to stick. Totally. Leslie Halleck is a horticulturist friend of mine. And what she says, like the biggest tip she can give people who want to go into horticulture, whether it's plant styling or whether it's like working at a greenhouse or whatever, is go work in a nursery because you are going to, the deluge of information you're going to have to learn in order to serve your clients at such a fast pace is amazing. And you'll just come into contact with so many different plants. Yeah, totally. And I, you start to make these funny connections, like the Monstera has, looks like it has like monster claws. And like, you just make so many like silly little things and you don't forget them. And before you know it, it's like, I think I can maybe charge people for these services. I don't know. And it just becomes this sort of fake it till you make it until you're like, oh, yeah, I really got this. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, I'm raising my rates. (laughs) That's the best feeling, too, when you're like, (laughs) yeah, now I'm raising my rates (laughs) and now I'm booked. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. So you probably have their dream job. You get to go into people's apartments, see all sorts of real estate assess the situation, make plant recommendations. You know, I think this idea of a plant consultant or a plant stylist is a dream for most plant enthusiasts. I think a lot of people want to transition into the plant space, but don't know how. So let's focus on like that first year of after you consulting for pizza. And I love that for you. Like, I love that era, like that season of life. I think that's so important. Because I also think not having too much money associated when you figure stuff out is very important because it can really like kind of cramp your style. But what did that first year of you starting to charge look like? What was your suite of services? How did you come up? And you don't have to share rates, but like, how did you come up with rates? Did you make packages? Like, because I would also assume if people just want one plant, you also have to assess like, is this even worth your time to go and give one plant recommendation? So like, Once you had that moment of, okay, I'm turning this into a side hustle, where do I start? What did that look like? 
Well, it's funny because I was in the unique position where anything was better than where I was at. Because I was student teaching and I was a full-time student at the same time, I was making less than minimum wage. And so charging someone 25 bucks for me to pop over to your house and then maybe you buy me dinner... Oh my God, I am making a profit. Win. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Big win. So it's not like I was leaving my career in finance to pursue my passion and had to take a major pay cut. So it was only up. So I'd like to start with that. But equally, I never sat down. There was no moment of, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a business plan. And then I'm going to do this, 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 and this. I have the privilege to say that demand came before I was ready. Mm -hmm. But my favorite phrase is preparation meets opportunity because I don't for one second want this to sound like luck. When the client came, it was a mixture of me being prepared to take the client on and also feeling confident enough to learn as I go. And I think that balance is crucial for anyone who's starting something new. Come and get your garlic, plan friends. Get it while it's available. I personally am entering my garlic girl era, so I need to let you know that it is time to order your garlic with Territorial Seed Company. TSC, Territorial Seed Company, is the king or queen of mail order perfect garlic ready to grow and give you all of the delicious harvests of garlic cloves and scapes that you could dream of. And they are a beloved partner of this podcast. You might think it's too early to order garlic, but you're planting your garlic in the fall and you need to order your garlic now so you have it in time to plant it. And also garlic is a hot topic with gardeners and stuff sells out with territorial seed. So if you don't know, if you've never grown garlic before, it's an amazing member of the onion family. It's got an incredible flavor and a very diverse range of garlic flavors going from mild, sweet, and mellow to hot and spicy, and even some that are purple. Garlic is so much more than the bland bulb that you get at the supermarket, but you're only going to learn if you grow it yourself. There are two different types, hard neck and soft neck garlic. Hard necks have scapes and usually larger cloves. Soft necks are braidable and smaller cloves. I am going to try growing both hard neck and soft neck this year so I can learn more about it as I grow. I think you should do the same. Territorial Seed Company is shipping garlic now. Varieties sell out quickly and you can get 10% off by being a member of this community. So go get your garlic, visit territorialseed.com slash growing joy and shop the amazing garlic selection that they have and get a 10% discount. So all you got to do to get your 10% discount is go to territorialseed.com slash growing joy. Go get your 10% discount. Go get all your garlic and tell me what you're growing. Friends, I just returned from the most amazing vacation in Italy, and particularly what made it so amazing is the work that I did before I left to refresh my Italian with Rosetta Stone. I've been prepping for this trip to Italy for the last several months with daily doses of Rosetta Stone on their easy-to-use platform and app. It makes learning a language or refreshing a language so easy, and I had so much fun while doing it. It was a great way to wake my brain up in the morning. If you have international travel coming up, I gotta tell you, knowing the basics of the local language helps so much. When we were in Italy, we were able to avoid the tourist traps and we were able to really plug into the culture, right? That's why you travel internationally. If you've had learning a language on your bucket list, Rosetta Stone has been the expert in language learning for 30 years. They've helped millions of people build the fluency and confidence to speak new languages through immersion. It even has this cool speech recognition feature, which actually tracks how you're pronouncing the language and gives you feedback on how to pronounce it with a more authentic accent. Whether you want to refresh a language skill you learned a while ago, like I did. Maybe you want to learn a new language to get the most out of your travel. Rosetta Stone can help get you there. They have 25 languages to choose from and a lifetime membership. So I learned Italian this year, but because I have the lifetime membership, I can learn Spanish or Chinese next year or in 10 years. And they're giving you an insane discount. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a limited time, Growing Joy listeners get 50% off Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Plan friend, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com slash today. That's rosetta, R-O-S-E-T-T-A, stone.com slash today. But to speak more specifically to like, what did it look like as far as like rates go and whatever, 
I took on the bare minimum. I took half an econ class in college. So I was like supply and demand, baby. What does this look like? How much does it cost for me to get to the Upper East Side? Okay, so that's 275 on the subway. That's an hour on the train. I'll probably buy lunch. And you just start to total up what could Mm -hmm. this cost look like and how much do I want to make? And so that literally, if it costs me a total of $40 for the day, I was charging them $40 because that's fair. And we live in an honest capitalistic society, do we not? (laughs) (laughs) And so I get on the subway, the A train's not working. I have to take a cab. Of course, I'm out multiple times. I'm tapping into my little tiny savings that I have. So all of these like things go wrong, but I'm like, I'm a businesswoman. And so I think it's just funny to reflect on all those moments because I was coming up with quotes for people saying, so this rubber tree is going to be 50 bucks, but then I go to the nursery and it's 75. I don't feel comfortable telling you it costs more because I'm just happy to have the gig. So I'm taking my own money to pay for these projects. So a lot of lessons were learned. Yep. You're basically paying them. Literally. For a year, that was it. And, but I think that's so important. I think the lesson learning is so important. Like the pain Sometimes like making a bad financial decision is like the only thing that's really going to teach you. You know, I hate to say it. It really is. And I'm like, I'll never charge less than 70 bucks for that rubber tree again if it's coming in a 10 inch planter. That's how I learned how to set my prices. And also, and this is early on, like that first year. And also how to think about the unexpected cost. You have to assume, especially in New York City, that everything's going to go wrong. So the biggest lesson I learned from year year one into year two, people love getting money back. Why not send them a quote for double what it's going to cost and then say, here's all the receipts. It actually didn't cost that much. Here's a refund. People love that. And then your ass is covered. So that's a big tip. So it sounds like it's the combination of counting the subway, the plants, the planters, the soil, all the stuff that you're also going to have but then also your time, right? So figuring out what your hourly rate is to like kind of factor that in and then back into a quote. Yeah, but I will say I wasn't really calculating my time at first. I started off doing hourly. I think it was $20 an hour. And because that's all I'd ever been paid before. And $20 an hour was a good job. And so I'm like, I'm charging hourly. Mariah, you cannot take longer than two hours for this because that's rude and they're going to know. Yeah, that's so interesting. And In terms of business, did you do an LLC? Did you get a business account? I feel like my biggest regret was like not getting a business account and a business credit card earlier, like having to figure out your personal money and your business money on one card. That was stressful. In terms of paperwork, what did you do? Yeah, no one talks about that. And I don't have a necessarily like financially literate family. I'm the first to go to college or the first to get a credit card. That's not for like a dream vacation. It's like intentional purposes and like spending and saving. So yeah, I don't even want to call it a lot of screw ups, but a lot of lessons and learning and overdrafting and like, but eventually I have this funny story. Um, My mentor is named Reggie Perlera. And I go to, this is one of the first office spaces I designed for this startup. And he's like, yeah, do your thing. You're going to be amazing, whatever. And then in the end, I was like, okay, here's the payment. You can just Venmo me, whatever. And they're like a legit business. Not to say that I wasn't at the time, but I was learning. And he was like, okay, well, just send me an invoice and we'll take care of it. And I was like, a what? I've never heard of that. What the hell is an invoice? So I Google it and I'm like, okay, so I need to get an EIN. What the hell is an EIN? It was just this crash course on trying to figure things out. But it's those moments where someone expects that you're speaking the same language. I like to rise to the occasion for those. So I'm like, yeah, I'll send you an invoice. Sure. But I'm like in my head, like, what the hell is that? So I go get the LLC and all the things and then figured it out. And then send him the invoice. Yeah. I think there's such an important, like healthy dose of fake it till you make it with entrepreneurship Mm -hmm. that I loved what you said earlier about like, what if I charged this? What if I charged this? Like that game that you can play with yourself. Like I remember When I had first started my podcast, I don't even think I had started the podcast yet. I was doing everything off my personal Instagram account and my personal email. It was like an idea. And I just like made a business card on some website, you know, those websites that you can just like make a rinky dink little business card. Totally. It said like Maria Faella, Bloom and Grow Radio Podcast. That's the old name of my podcast. And I took it to like a plant swap, like one of Summer Oaks's plant swap. And I was just like, yeah, I have this podcast. 
blah, blah, blah. And I was just, I just kind of faked it till I made it. But I feel like it was that insane courage or bravado, whatever. It was that ability to just kind of step into that next version of yourself totally. that allowed me to secure like awesome guests for my first 10 episodes and made the show actually look legit because there's that future version of yourself. Sometimes you have to just allow yourself to step into before it's time. And it's that preparation means opportunity that you talked about that kind of allows for that. Totally. But just being like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, sure. I can send you an invoice. Yeah. If you don't believe it, why should anyone else? Like I'm literally actively selling this thing that I think is a great fit for you. And of course there are really great salesmen out there and bad salesmen. But like, I think for that first year I was selling myself on myself. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. that, hits, <laughs> that hits deep. That's beautiful. So you had those first couple of years where you were like building, you were figuring out the invoicing. What did the middle stage look like? Because you've been doing this now for five years? Four years. Four years. So was there a moment where you were like, oh, okay, we're going to up level and raise the rates? Or like, when did you make your first hire? Ooh. Because I know you have a team, right? Yeah. So that came much later. I think like the middle part, I think I'll refer to it as like the talking my shit phase. I felt like I'd sold myself on me finally. Mm -hmm. And so now mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, if you don't want to buy me, something's wrong with you. <laughs> and that yeah, came from yeah. just sort of having this validation and actualization from larger companies or press or whatever. So basically it was Good Morning America. That like propelled me into a whole other universe because I went on there. I was the plant doctor for the day and whatever. And then I go to brunch with my family. It's bottomless brunch, whatever. People are like, oh my God, I just saw you on TV. It was like a surreal moment. And then I check my personal email and it is flooded, Maria, like flooded with really? people being like, I have this rubber tree. I didn't know a plant doctor existed. Are you free tomorrow? I'll pay whatever. And I was like, mom, Whoa. like what's happening? I don't know what to do. And so at this point I have my like makeshift website and like, a couple, like three or four business cards. And like, so that stage was like, okay, yeah, I'm doing this for real now. And this is like, I've got to incorporate this. Like I'm going to actively pursue expanding and creating a business. Cause at this point it was still like, I'm a teacher, but I have this really cool thing going on. And so I think this propelled me into, no, I am the plant doctor and stylist because GMA came up with that name. They asked for a title card for me. And I was like, educator of plants. Like I didn't know. And they were like the plant doctor. Right. And I was like, let's go for it. So that middle stage was like tons of press and actualization from companies and publications. And there's something about that. Whereas like now looking back, I can be like, oh, all you had to do is believe in yourself. You don't need an article to tell you that you're the plant doctor. But at the same time, like back then, no, that was everything I needed. Because if I'm in the New York Times and I say it costs 275, damn it, it costs 275 because you found me. And if you have a New York Times subscription and I can't afford one, then I know how much you can charge. So I had all these little pieces that I could add to the puzzle. Man, I think that's so, especially if you're a female listening, I think that's so important because I went through such a similar experience I remember my first sales calls for the podcast, I would mm. cry. I would be in tears after them because it was so painful to like ask people for money for this thing that I worked so hard to do. Mm -hmm. Because I also think as women, we're so used to like fawning. We're so used to whatever you want. How can I help? Blah, blah, blah. And plants and gardening feels very feminine as well. It feels like, well, you should just be helping me with this. Like, what do you mean you're going to try? You know what I mean? And that moment that you described it being like, yeah, I'm worth mm -hmm. it. And something I tell myself a lot is like, would a man be embarrassed to ask for this amount of money? And usually the answer is no. No. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not going to let myself do this either. And I don't mean to like go on a feminist rampage, but no. I do think that's something that women need to earmark that I think sometimes it's harder for us to assert our worth and it's harder for us to assert that we can be the expert, even if we don't have the degree in horticulture or we don't whatever, you know, if you're making a positive impact on someone's life. That's good. And once again, that preparedness and opportunity, like you had been doing this for a year or so, you had tons of clients under your belt. You had worked through those beginning kinks. So when Good Morning America came to you, you were able to rise to that occasion. 
totally. I'm sure everybody's going to want to know, did Good Morning America find you or did you pitch yourself to them? Oh my God. They found me. It was like the second to last day after school let out. I had been student teaching that year. And so I had gotten my first full-time teaching offer to be a head teacher. That was my dream at this school in Manhattan. I was like, I'm going to do it. And so my first interview was the next day. And in August, you have to report back for teacher training. So I'm checking my email. I'm at the bar with my boyfriend at the time. And I see this like, good morning, America. I'm like, I've been getting tons of like spam and junk mail. So like, this is probably nothing, but it was this person. I can't remember their name. And it was, if you can give me a call as soon as possible, I'd love to chat with you about coming on GMA in August. And it was the week that I was supposed to go for teacher training. You can't be a first time teacher and not go to teacher training. And so I had this call with this amazing person and he was dead serious. Like, we want you to come on and do it. And I had to make a decision. And I just was like, good morning, America probably comes around once. Teacher training is going to come around every August for the rest of my life. So I think I'm going to pass on this year of teaching and just see what comes of it. And it was the best thing that I've ever done. Mm. That's amazing. It was a crazy time. Is that an intuitive thing? Is that a gut? Was that a gut? yeah, this is what I'm going to do? Or was there like a lot of pros and cons lists? I tend to only do pros and cons lists and go back and forth when I already know what I want to do. Because I think in my mind, I'm like giving it considerable thought. But I think my gut is like, I'm the first to go to college. I'm the first to properly move out, live in New York City, have my own place. All of these things have never been done before. And I feel like I'm living my ancestors' wildest dreams. And I'm like, I'm not going to freaking stop today to respectfully, God bless them. I love them. I'm passionate about it. Clean up boogers and teach math for the day. That will always be there. I love teaching more than anything in this world. But I equally am like, if I were to go back to the classroom today and ask my kids what they think I should do, I know they would say, Miss Mariah, are you crazy? What are you doing here? Go on TV. And so when I told them that I made that decision, they just were like, when is it coming out? Oh my God, we can't wait to see it. The parents were like, you're young. You shouldn't have gray hair right now. You need to go and do this. It was just a resounding, like, what the hell are you doing here? Go on GMA. Wow. That's amazing. I just got goosebumps. That's beautiful. Yeah. I was like, what's actually happening here? Like this feels like when you're in it, you don't recognize the gravity of it, but like you never know when you're in the middle of a moment that's going to change the rest of your life. And it paid off, right? Like you said, you got all that work from it and you also needed that, I would assume by not going back to teaching, you needed that year to kind of carve out the space to allow you to step into what this would look like full time. I mean, I felt like I was a musical theater performer before the pandemic. The show I was in got shut down because of COVID. So I was unemployed. And I don't know if I would have had the strength to say no to Broadway again. Like I needed Broadway to be taken away from me in order to be like, what could this look like if I did do this full time? And sometimes you need to kind of give yourself that opportunity of why not me and But what would it look like if I don't think this is possible? Like if it was possible, what would it look like? Yeah, totally. And you just spoke to it because that's exactly what happened. My first year of teaching would have been on Zoom. Like it was months later that COVID happened. And how perfectly primed. I mean, the pandemic when houseplants went crazy. So what does your business look like now? You offer a bunch of different services. You have a team. Like where are you at now? What is the manifestation of all of that? It's craziness. It's right now, I feel like I've, I'm juggling. I've got my hands in so many pots. My favorite pun, people hate when I say, but I live for it. But I feel like I have my hands in so many things, but I'm trying to figure out what is serving me now because I, I came from this space of starting out and being like, I'm just grateful to have a client. I'm just grateful to be doing this. I'm grateful to be making more than 20 an hour. It was just like, take in what's being given to me. And I feel like the past few months, it's been, no, no, no. What do you want to ask for? And that shift is like, Ooh, it's scary, but I'm also like, no, receive that and be intentional about the things that you're asking for. And like, What serves you? Do you want to go all the way to the Upper West Side to pot someone's house plant? Or would you rather maybe do something locally and it's for like one person who just has a rubber tree that their mom passed on to them? Like I get to pick and choose the projects I want to take and that feels so fulfilling. 
and equally just speaking to expanding and having a team, I've hired like random contractors here and there because I just get some anxiety about having someone on full time. I'm like, I'm already a freelancer who like barely has health insurance. So like, I don't want to bring someone else on (laughs) and have your whole livelihood (laughs) depend on my ability to like bring the money in. So in hiring people, I learned so many lessons. I'm like, oh, maybe you can take that plant appointment and I'll take this one and we'll bounce back and forth. And I had this very humbling experience where clients were being direct and rightfully so about, no, 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 I wanted Mariah to come. I thought Mariah was coming. I thought I had built a plant business and I thought I had made like a Martha Stewart brand and these are my little Martha Stewart people. But no, 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 they want specifically me. And so I had to figure out and learn how to delegate and create a team to free up my time to go and do appointments as opposed to me working back at home and answering all the inquiries and sending other people out. So I had to figure that out very quickly. That's so interesting because also, you know, they say with entrepreneurship, you should figure out what your special sauce is and what no one else can do, and then spend your time doing that and then outsource all of that. And it sounds like that's exactly what you figured out. And you get to go play in the soil and be connected to the plants. Like you get to stay rooted in what you started this for instead of answering emails all day. Exactly. But And I also think a big piece of me was like, I don't want someone to mess this up, plain and simple. I don't want you handling invoices. I don't want you talking to the client before we've locked in something. I don't want to be off of CC. I want to see everything. And so I've really had to learn that I can't be everywhere all at once more than just physically, but like, I can't be looped in on everything. And at the same time, if I am going to take that route, there is a cost for me. And so no matter how booked and busy we are, it doesn't matter if I can't enjoy my sanity sitting at dinner with my boyfriend on a Saturday because someone's fiddly fig is losing three leaves. That's not success to me. And I've had to rework what that definition was. Oh my goodness. What a juicy nugget. (laughs) (laughs) Because I think so many entrepreneurs go through that. It's like, especially once you get the work and the work is whether or not you buy groceries that week, like you get addicted to it and then you can swing to the other side and work seven days a week and never turn it off. Every entrepreneur needs therapy. I know I said that on my last podcast too, my last entrepreneur profile. I'm like, everybody needs therapy because it's entrepreneurship. It's incredible. I wouldn't do anything else, but it's such a mental game of, wait, why did I get into this? To work life balance, to make my own hours, not to like work 24 seven. Totally. I'm sure you've seen the meme of like, I left my nine to yes. five to work 24 seven. To work 24 seven. And I hate that that sounds so like, poor me, woe is me, because it's not that. Like I wouldn't choose anything else, but equally like setting your boundaries is everything. And also knowing yourself, which sounds so cheesy, but like I know, for example, that like I give my all when I'm interviewing or on a podcast. It drains me because I just want to dive into everything and give every juicy, meaty nugget and just be emotionally raw. And so, no, I'm not going to feel like sending invoices or pitching out partnerships or anything after that. So I reserve all of my energy on those days to do exactly this. And so tomorrow, maybe that's my day to go administratively hard. And then, you know what? That was a really shit day. I hate sitting near the computer. I'm going to go pot plants the next day. So you start to get a feel for what your body says is okay and what isn't. And then you honor that. And then you can start to create those boundaries. Yeah, I love it. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test. Because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible. So I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... 
that drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. I'm Dr. Laurie Santos, host of the Happiness Lab podcast. Making new friends and maintaining old friendships is a great way to boost your happiness. There are lots of sources of well-being standing around you. You just have to tap into them. But sadly, we don't always feel up for being sociable. If I was approaching a stranger, my heart would race. I'd feel like I was going to throw up. I just had so much anxiety around it. So in a new season of the show, I'll tackle how to make firm friendships firmer, right through to the joy you can find in talking to total strangers. I'm very much enjoying your animal print scarf, madam. You look wonderful. The steps to becoming more social might surprise you, but trust me, they're things you can introduce into your daily routine right away. I adore your purple hair, madam. It pops. So listen to The Happiness Lab on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your shows. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click Click the community plan. So what does Greenpeace look like now? You have plant styling and plant doctor. What's the difference? So plant styling tends to be more of a blank space. And so that's where I will come in and assess your lighting, aesthetic. We sort of have this like, it's almost like speed dating. We sit down and I ask you all these questions to try and figure out who you are and what your space is about. And then I'm matching the right plants for your space based on what you're trying to achieve. It's a mixture of me talking you out of that fiddle leaf fig or being like, no, you can do it. You have plenty of light. You just didn't have been the right space last time. And then the last piece of that is planters. That's the fun part. People love shopping for planters, whether it's them leaning on me to come up with the design and bringing things in. Some people like to be surprised or it's them coming plant shopping with me. So that's my preference when we can like do it together. It's so fun. Yeah. And then plant doctoring is tends to be when people have plants already, 
And they're just at a loss for what the hell is going on in their jungle. It's like, are these mealybugs or is it flowering? Like, is the fiddly fig happy or is it not? Does it need a bigger pot? And so it can range from me coming in to just simply like, I'm telling you what's wrong with the plants and then you're going off and fixing it. Or it's me having a virtual call first and I'm looking at each of the plants. I'm assessing, ooh, that is in a 12 inch pot. It's been in there for seven years, time for a 14 inch. And then I come equipped with all those supplies. So there's just different tiers and layers of service. It's basically, we start with the initial call. You tell me where you're at and I meet you there. Yeah, I love that. And then you've also built this like fabulous influencer side of your business. So where, how did that come about? And, you know, you work with some amazing brands. How has that evolved for you? And that piece came with like, just wanting to be raw and honest about this whole plant situation, kind of like what we were talking about earlier. Like so many people, I think there was this notion during this early era, I think right before the pandemic or during the pandemic of you're not a real plant parent unless you have 50 million plants. And I just was like, I don't like this culture, especially when we're all getting laid off of like more is more. I'm like, what if you had this one thing that meant a lot to you and you found joy in that and you expressed that? And so I think I, at some point, started feeling comfortable talking to myself in a screen on the internet and people really enjoyed it. And maybe that was my longing for connection with the plant community, but I just felt like that was my way to teach. And I think what came of that was like me just showing off the things that I love, the products I love, the soil that I've been using and all the like cheap tips of how to not overdraft your account when you want to get a major cactus. Like, and so off the back of that, I'd occasionally hear from brands. I'll never forget my first brand. This is like early days. It was one of those like flat tummy tea knockoffs. And I was like, ah. <gasps> they want to pay me $200. I'm retiring. Like this is it for me. I found some easy money. And so again, kind of what we talked about earlier, like I'm years later in the place of being like, "Mm, that doesn't align with me. I don't think I'm going to do that. Or brands coming to me and asking for creative, like, Hey, what would it look like if we did a partnership between this planter and this soil? How would you Mariah make this work instead of us sending you a creative brief? So that's sort of how that developed over time. But I think it's really important to, at a certain point, you'll start to go into, especially in this day and age, thinking of how can I get brand partnerships and let me make content that will appeal to these brands. I think if you do that, you're setting yourself up for failure. I like to make my content. And if it just so happens that a brand is like, this is freaking awesome, then we've got some synergy here. But I think you really suppress your creativity and like your intention behind connecting with an audience if you go into it thinking, oh, I'm trying to pursue a partnership because it will just never come off as authentic. Yeah, totally. A hundred percent, especially as we move out of influencer culture and into content creation where it's everybody sees through influencers now. It's more like, it's so much more effective to just kind of show your life, create good content about it and then have people ask, oh my God, wait, what's that pot? Or what's that this or whatever? Totally. It's cool to see you working with non-plant companies and bridging the gap because plants should be everywhere, not just with the fertilizer or the soil. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I wanted to create a space where people can come to my page or just like interact with any of the content that I'm making and not be like, because sometimes your plants are happy. Like sometimes you genuinely don't need anything. I didn't want to just be this encyclopedia for plant care because I know I have more to offer than that. And equally, I'm like, I think we're moving, like you said, as we move into content creation, like we're getting closer and closer to people just being more ingrained into your like personal life. People want nuggets of like who you are and can I trust you? Are you just selling me mascara because you made $20,000 from this deal? Or do you genuinely like this mascara? And so I haven't gotten a Hennessy partnership to this day, but everyone knows that I love Hennessy. And the day I get a Hennessy partnership, it's real. I'm not just... They better pay up. You've sold a lot of Hennessy. They better pay. <laughs> and I'm the one buying it. But at the same time, I feel so blessed because if I have a partnership that is way off, let's just say it's with a freaking sock company. Everyone who sort of follows me and has been a rider from the beginning is in those comments, like, get your bag, sis, get it, queen. And there ha- it has nothing to do with the plants, but it's this sort of like, 
we've grown with you and we see what it is you're trying to do. And you're not trying to sell us something for the sake of selling it, but like we believe in you as the brand. And I think, I don't know how that happened. It was not intentional, but I think it's just these raw and honest conversations. Like the most intimate conversation I can have with you is when I wake up and I'm still in my bonnet and haven't brushed my teeth yet. And those are the moments where I just want to connect and get some shit off my chest. And so if it's received that way, I'm so grateful. And it's just fun to talk with people. Yeah. I mean, I think as your follower who also is so excited to see you do any sort of collaboration is you've also been super transparent about the fact that like this is your business. I think that's another thing. Some people in the plant space like aren't very transparent about what's paid and what isn't because it's like, this is my hobby. It's not my business, whatever. And it's like, at some point, if we're doing this full time, it's business, you know, like you've got to do it. And so I think people, and you've always been very transparent about that because it's been your business for so long that I think people are like, oh yeah, this is part of her business. And one of the posts is going to be a sponsored post. And then four of them is going to be just her like talking about plant, you know, it's like, it's just part of the game. Definitely. And I think it's really important to set that tone and that dynamic very early on, because then I think once you lose trust from the people that are with you all the way through, it's a done deal. And in my mind, I've always thought if I'm partnering with these companies, I don't see it as a great opportunity. It is one, but I'm, that's not my first thought. My thinking is, this brand is partnering with me because they need me more than I need them. They need diversity. They need all these things that they have in their deck that sound fluffy and nice. And so if you're going to profit off of me for a dollar, I'm going to get what I need out of it too. And I'm going to make sure that I'm getting a discount code for my people. I'm going to make sure that if you're running it as an ad, I'm getting X percent. And so I think every time I do a partnership, it's an opportunity for me to clue people in on how, if you get a partnership, how to do this the right way and make sure you're eating too, because capitalism will always capitalize. I'm not going to run off on a tangent, but that's just how I feel about partnerships. (laughs) No, I appreciate it. I think for people interested in pursuing brand deals like that, I think that's really important to hear because they will make you feel like they're giving you a huge deal with for $50 and you have to be like, actually, it's a thousand dollars. Totally. Yeah. But okay, so I want to ask you, you've been to countless apartments, you've plant styled for so many people. Can you give like three of your top like plant styling tips? I think plant styling is a big thing for people. For sure. The first one is my favorite one. And that's like, work with what you have. You have more stuff that you can use than you think. You do not need the brand new CP2 pot, but I don't want to block my blessings speaking of partnerships. So maybe you need it, (laughs) but you have more at home than you think. And it's just a matter of reconfiguring that item you have to make it work for you. So if you have that glass jar, that Mason jar, and like, I feel like Mason jar decor was like earlier 2000s and now Mm -hmm. it's fading. But I'm like, you can revamp that thing and put a different plant and water in there and make it look cute. There are so many ways to work with what you have. And you never know what you can do with something when your budget is tiny. Like you get so creative when you overdraft your account. So that's my first tip. Yeah. The Mm -hmm. second is play with color or texture. I think sometimes it can be really intimidating walking into these aesthetically pleasing plant shops where they have their displays all pretty. And then you bring one or two plants home and then you're underwhelmed because it doesn't look like yeah, the shop. Yeah. It's like when you go to Ikea and you see the curtains you want in the showroom, you bring the curtains home and you're like, why is it not giving showroom? So right. yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> be intentional about the colors or the patterns that you're picking and give yourself time it can be really easy to just like go all in and be like, I want this, 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 and this. And then you bring it home and it's not what you thought. Like start slowly and allow that to be a part of your journey and pick one pattern or color that you want to commit to each time. And eventually it will all tie together. I think that's really important. And with colors, like what do you suggest for like how many colors or how many textures you pick for one room? I had never heard of the color wheel until like two years ago. The color wheel is where it's at. If you've never heard of the color wheel, look it up. And in short, you pick a color on one side and directly across it, you will find a color that match, not matches, but complements it really well. When I tell you like my brain was broken when I saw that like eggplant was complementing like an olive green, I was like... It's like a cheat code for design and you're going to feel like Martha Stewart once you look at the color wheel. But in general, if you're not using the color wheel, it's like pick a statement color. If you want to do red, 
do your red, but then maybe you're like doing like a nude or a tan or something to offset that. You can find your like main piece, but ideally you're finding things that are complementing the one really bold piece. What do you feel about pots? I have ma- the majority terracotta pots because I just like how it's anchored in that earthy tone. But if they don't want terracotta, if they want to go colorful pots, what's your suggestion for how to like use pots as a way to kind of add and elevate a design instead of make it so confusing? Because I remember in my beginning stages, I had blue and white pots, pink pots, gold pots. Mm -hmm. Like I had so many different pots and the pots actually are what made my collection feel chaotic. It wasn't the plants. It was just too many different pot vibes. So what would you suggest there? I would say every time you add a plant into your space in a pot, take a picture of that section. That way, the next time you go to the plant shop, you have a reference point and you know not to get hot pink because you just got red. Like, don't do yourself like that. Like, have a reference. But at the same time, it's like, if you want to have rainbow pots, that is fine. But then you're being intentional about heights. Like, maybe one of them's a bit bigger and maybe one of them's a bit taller. And you're clustering them, but you don't just have, like, 10 plants on the windowsill. Because then you're just trying to get light from where it's coming from and you're not intentional about your design. So I think the chaos comes from individual purchases you're out and you see a pot you like and so you get it but that pot that you happen to like in that moment doesn't work with the three you have at home and you weren't thinking about that so you can eliminate that from happening if you have a photo of the space that you might be thinking about adding to yeah totally i love that i have to ask you about this book yes i have to say when i first heard you were writing a book And then I found out it was a children's book. I was like, wait, what? She's not making a plant styling book or a plant care book. So I'm so curious. I mean, now that I've learned you used to be an educator, it makes more sense. But like, where did this idea come from? Did you get approached? Was it something you really wanted to create that you sought out a book deal for? Like, to me, this was just as your follower, I was like, whoa, this is an element of Mariah I didn't even know existed. So can you kind of give us some insight into like how that came to be? I love that you said, wait, what? Because I feel like this five-year journey has been a collection of wait, what moments. And so I (laughs) anticipated that being the reaction and that's awesome. Yeah. But to me, it like, it made so much sense. But the process of it was, so again, I was in grad school and while on the side, I was doing this plant stuff um, and it wasn't like a full-time thing. The one thing I knew was to graduate from the Bank Street College of Education, you need to have a thesis or a final project of some sort. You get four options. You can write a curriculum. You can do all these other things. And then another option was to write a picture book because I was in a literacy program. And so my advisor, shout out to Molly Kruger. It would not have happened without her. She said, I think it's a really missed opportunity if you don't write a picture book. Just try it and see where it goes from there. And so I started writing this story. Of, I knew it was going to be about plants because at this time, like my plant styling was like legitimized, but I didn't know what story I wanted to tell, but I just knew that it was going to be something plant related. Long story short, I hear from a publisher one day, Razorbill, they reach out and they were like, we love your work. We saw you on GMA and New York Times. We're wondering if you're interested in making sort of like a plant how-to book. And I was like, how'd you get this email? There's no way you're interested in me. There are people with like, (laughs) (laughs) you're like, do you mean me? Like you're lying again. Right. (laughs) You're like, are you reaching out to the right person? Yeah. That's exactly how I felt too. (laughs) Yeah. It's crazy. (laughs) And I was like, that sounds amazing. My second thought, if I'm being completely honest was, I don't think I have anything to contribute to the space because I'm seeing so many plant, how to care for your plant books. And in my mind, I'm like, the money I'm spending on all these books is money I could put towards buying a plant, trying it out, it dying, and then me getting three more. So I was like, what can I put out into the world that that hasn't been done? And equally, I was like, well, I'm working on this thesis for my graduate program and it's about plants. However, it's, it's for kids though. So I don't know if you're interested. And they were like, circle back in six months when you're done and then we'll see it through. So six months later, I was like, okay, I don't even know if they remember me. They probably got fired. It's COVID. I just sent it. And their original reaction was, oh my gosh, we weren't expecting a story that it's about loss. It's about plants. But I think they were just expecting like a animated book with like how to care for your plants and whatever. I think it caught them off guard. And so they were like, we were expecting something a bit more lighthearted. And I said, 
I completely understand that. And for context, this is during the height of June, yeah, June 2020. So the height of Black Lives Matter in the US and all over the world. And so I responded politely and lovingly saying, I can't think of a better time for this book to come out. All we're seeing right now is Black loss, Black death, mourning. And I don't think we're supposed to be seeing this much of that in such a like dense amount of time. And equally, we're not helping people or even kids through this time. We're just consuming all of this information and trauma and we have no way to deal with it. And so I think you have a responsibility to put a book like this out, not a lighthearted story because I'm not feeling very lighthearted right now. And in the end, they were like, you're totally right. This is the perfect book for this time period and let's make it happen. And so they made it happen. That's amazing for how you advocated for yourself and others, like the necessity of the book, the fact that you got a no or a, "Ah, I don't know if it's a fit. And then you were like, no, 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 you're going to say yes. Or not even that, but it's that it goes back to that conversation of like asserting your worth and also the greater good of the impact that you knew your book was going to make is incredible. Now, I know both of your parents are alive because I follow you and I saw the heartwarming let me show my dad my book in Target. Love that. Where did the idea for the loss come from? Was it the Black Lives Matter movement or was there something else that that came out of? It was my history of teaching. So when I first started teaching, it okay. was in Southeast DC and I worked with what's considered or called at-risk youth. And so it was a population of mostly young boys who experienced trauma that a lot of us will never and should never experience. And so That's what pushed me into teaching. That's what made me go, oh yeah, I'm going to go to grad school for education. I don't want to just like get a teaching job. If I'm going to like mold children's lives, I want to be fully equipped to the nth degree and use all the privilege that I can to make that happen. And so I think that's where the, I wanted to speak to their experiences, but equally, this isn't a book about loss. This isn't a book about tragedy. This is a book about life. This is a book about resilience and it's a celebration. It's a celebration. And I can't point to too many types of media that showcase and highlight black lives that are not rooted in trauma. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I do want to share your story. And I'm like, there were moments in time though, where I was like, who am I to tell this story? I have both my parents and like, I don't come from even a 10th of like the environment that you come from, but equally And the time that I did spend in the classroom and with these kids, I felt empowered. And for the first time, the moments that they expressed to me that they felt seen, it sort of was this nodding of like, if you don't do this, who's going to? And so it was a moment to use my privilege and my stance of how far I've come to tell the story of someone who may not be able to. That's beautiful. And did you choose boy versus girl because of the boys that impacted you in DC? I went back and forth. A lot of my friends were surprised that I went with boy. I think I find that there's a very unique way that people approach this idea of Black males expressing grief as opposed to Black women. And I think while I feel very comfortable telling the story as a Black woman of my grief or the way that I express my feelings, like not always being seen. I hadn't come across a resource that existed for men or for boys in particular. But I think the other piece of that last part was the height of Black Lives Matter. Everything that had happened, I just thought, oof, I'm feeling like the story, yeah, the character just came to me and I stuck with it. I didn't want to fight it. It's such a beautiful book. It's perfect. Thank you. As you said, it's exactly what it's supposed to be. Who is the book for in terms of age? Yeah, it's four to eight years old. And I didn't pick that. The publisher has their system of deciding who it's appropriate for. And so I wrote it with the intention of it being for a six or seven year old. But the really unique thing about it is it is literally for everyone. And this is not me trying to hashtag add you right now. But I cannot tell you how many times I've gone to sign books over the past week or so. And of course, the unique thing with picture books is You think your audience is kids, right? Because you want it to be good for kids. Kids don't have their pocket money that they're coming. It's their parents. Yeah. And their aunties. and their And so they're flipping through it at the book signing and they're like shedding a tear. And I don't know. I'm used to on page six, such and such happens and I'm kind of numb to it. 
However, when you're reading it for the first time, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this is the book I needed when X, Y, and Z was happening. And so I really think that it's changing our language from this is a children's book. No, this is a picture book. Because how often do we go back and watch The Lion King and it hits us? Or how often do we watch Inside Out and it really speaks to us? So this idea that picture books are just for kids, I really want to change the narrative and make it so that it's accessible for healing that piece of inner child that hasn't gotten to yet. That is so beautiful. I I need to like sit with that for a minute before I respond. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, because I think... Obviously, I've read the book. Number one, the illustrations are incredible. Who's your illustrator? Shout out. Aliana Harris. I like could not have asked. Did you get to pick her? Yeah. So how it works with Penguin is like, or at least if you're a first time author, my experience was you get a list to choose from. And I was like, how do you expect me to choose? We narrowed it down to five, three. And then Aliana, we found out her birthday's the day before mine. She's also from Philly, Black woman. I just was like, okay, so we're cousins probably. We have to do this. Yeah. She's amazing. Amazing. Did you get to collaborate with her a lot on it? Or did you write the book, send it to her, and then she kind of came back with the full illustration? So when I had written this book, I wrote the text. And then in parentheses was image description, because I can't draw for crap. And so I didn't want to do a disservice to an illustrator being like, what is that? So it said image description, Malcolm on the stoop with, so this is all in my mind. And so a big piece of me was like, I'm curious to know what she sees. And so the first version of it was like very small image descriptions, but then I want to see what you come up with. And then the process was, okay, well, that's pretty sick that you envisioned this. Let's go with that. However, for page four, I'm feeling really strongly about this. I don't want to change that. So that collaborative process was amazing. The only thing I hated about it was that it was all virtual because it was COVID. Like, I would have loved to have met with her over coffee or drinks and come up with like the leaf at the end of the page. But yeah, it was an amazing creative process. It's shown in the book. It's so beautiful. I love too that you have all the different, you have like anatomically correct houseplants with their Latin names at the end. Like you have, I love the the back of the book, the glossary. The glossary, yes. I love the glossary. Me too. I thought it was great. The glossary is my thing like, there's always that kid that's like, oh my God, you know how you want more at the end of a book or like that kid that's like goes into science mode or after you watch a good movie and you go look up the characters or what happened next, like the glossary is supposed to give you more. Well, yeah. And as I read the book, I mean, I too was kind of surprised as I read it. I was like, yeah, this is about plants, but this is about so much more. This is about grief. This is about loss. This is about, you know, this very unique experience. But I love the glossary too, because it really does get them started young on houseplants. I mean, houseplants are a very intrinsic part of the book. And then that glossary lets them kind of dive deeper, which I love. And I do feel like you're 100% right when you say it's for everyone, because everyone experiences loss. And I don't think it's a book. I mean, it's a perfect book for if you have a kid in your life who experiences loss, you can buy them this book. But I think more, it's about reading the book before you experience loss almost to like, prime you for understanding what this could be like. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. And what type of loss? Is it losing a person? Is it like losing that thing that you really wanted? Like we all experience loss at some point. And yeah, you make an amazing point that it really, it can be used as a tool to equip you for something that may be coming later on in life, because that's the one thing we know for sure. Nothing lasts forever. And so I really wanted this to be a resource or a bridge to bring people into that conversation. And also the biggest piece of that was mourning does not look the same for everyone because mourning is a luxury to be able to say, oh, you know what? I Such and such happened and I'm feeling the effects of that six days later, six months later, 60 years later. And so what that looks like for Black boys who don't always have the words and even like the space to say, Ooh, I'm sad. Like I wanted this to be a moment for them to physically point out, Oh, that's what that looks like. That's what sadness can sound like because it can be really hard to describe it on your own. And as parents, they don't always have the tools to say, Ooh, I know exactly how I want to go into this conversation about how, or what it means that you've lost your dog or that you've lost whatever, like, Having a resource is the best thing that you can create and have as a teacher or a parent. Absolutely. My sister-in-law is a 
I believe she's a second or third grade teacher. I'm sending this to her, your book to her for her classroom. We have a lot of teachers that are, you know, listeners, a lot of Mm. parents, a lot of aunties, uncles, a lot of people who know little children. And also, honestly, as an adult, I thoroughly enjoyed reading the book as well. Um, (laughs) So where can people find the book? And also where can people find you? Because I'm sure everybody's going to be obsessed, as obsessed with you as I am after this conversation (laughs) and got to go follow the journey. Got to go see those amazing ads that you're putting on your Instagram. (laughs) So where can we find all the things? So the book is linked in my bio, um, but you can find it at all major retailers online. One of my big goals is to get it stocked in on the shelves. So as of now, it's online, but you can also get it at independent retailers. You can find it linked in my bio at Greenpeace. It's green with an E, G-R-E-E-N-E dot piece, P-I-E-C-E. And my website, everything's there. You can find me at the same handle on TikTok. You can find me on the subway carrying dirt. I'm everywhere. (laughs) If there's a girl on the subway with fabulous (laughs) hair, with a huge rubber tree, it's probably Mariah and and dirt. It's probably Mariah. (laughs) Amazing. We'll link to all of those things in the show notes. I'm so happy we finally connected and also timing is everything. So this was the perfect moment for us to connect. And I look forward to having a drink with you in the city IRL, hopefully in the future. I can't wait. And I just have to say, Maria, thank you so much for creating this platform and this space to have real plant talk, because I just need you to know that there are so many plant resources and spaces where people talk and communicate. And I feel like I don't have space to go into them because they're just so niche. And like, if you don't have 50 million plants, it's not for you, but you've just created such a remarkable space for people to be themselves and it's accessible to everyone. So thank you for all of your work and thank you for having me. Oh my gosh, my pleasure. Our pleasure. Is this incredible (laughs) that this is what we do for a living? It's like, what the hell? It's crazy. (laughs) What is actually happening? It's wild. It's wild. Thank you so much to Mariah. She's so cool. I'm meeting up with her in the city tomorrow, actually. I liked her so much. We're bringing our plant friendship IRL, hashtag plant friends IRL. Go follow her on all the socials, Greenpeace, green with an E, peace, P-I-E-C-E. We're going to put all the links in the show notes and consider getting a copy of her book for a teacher or a parent in your life. It's truly beautiful. It's gorgeously illustrated. Start them young, get our kids interested in plants young and tells a really beautiful story. So I hope this was inspiring. Mariah is a testament to what we can build in this gorgeous space. And I hope this inspires you to go style up a corner of your home, maybe do something different, maybe get a new planter, maybe unify your planters, maybe think about, you know, the shapes and the heights that we talked about. Show me on Instagram at Growing Joy with Maria. Tag me in all of your plant styling endeavors. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. 
you can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm.